Hello viewers, welcome to Runa, taking you through this story for A level applied mathematics. And this video, we are going to go through the marking guide for USCE UNEB for the year 2023. So this video is suitable for students in both Senior 5 and Senior 6 offering principal mathematics as part of their combination. So the paper contains two sections, section A where all questions are compulsory and section B which contains eight questions and the student is supposed to answer any five. But because this is a revision, we shall go through the entire paper. So question one says, a coin is biased such that when it is tossed, okay, the head is twice as likely to occur as the tail. Find the probability that in seven tosses, there will be exactly two heads. So the keyword is biased. Biased means, cause a coin, ideally, there is a head and a tail. And ideally, the probability of a head occurring would be a half, and the probability of a tail occurring would be a half. But that is when it is unbiased. When it is biased, it means the chances are unequal. Here, biased means the chances are equally likely to occur. But when they are unequal, then it is biased. That is why they have told us probability of getting a head is twice the probability of getting a tail. So I can express it in terms of ratio form. Probability of a tail to head is 1 to 2. That's what they have told us. Therefore, by ratios, probability of a tail is 1 over the total ratio, which is 3. Probability of a head is 2 over the total ratio, which is 3. So, because of this word, 7 tosses, it means there is a repetitive process. That's why it is now a binomial with n seven trials and probability of success one over three why do you say one over three it is because of this they said in seven tosses there will be exactly two tails do you see this white tail it means tail is just is the success you are interested in that's why we call it the probability of success when you head when you get a head it means probability of failure which is true So exactly two heads, that's why there is, the word exactly is what gives us this equal sign. And the formula for binomial is this, 7 which is n combination 2 which you want times p to, p to power r where p is this and r is this 2. Then times 2 where I choose this probability of fail to power n minus r which is this. Because 7 minus 2 gives you 5. Then you can use a calculator to get the output. And that's what they wanted. So that's how you could get the 5 marks. So question analysis, like I've always told you, you name after marking usually releases a report on the work of candidates and that report contains what the question required the weakness of candidates what made them misfire and also the advice so that the next candidates do not make the same mistakes so usually these reports are available on the uneb website so i encourage you to check look for them because they contain all subjects for me i have extracted out only for math but they had many, many subjects they do. So physics, biology, chemistry, history, literature, GP, all subjects are there. So I encourage you to look through them before you sit for your UNEP so that you can know what the question required in that year, what made the students misfire, and what advice have they given you. So question one required candidates to identify probability of obtaining a tail or ahead when biased when a biased coin is tossed and thereafter determine the probability of 
exactly two two tails. So the question was popular, meaning many students attempted it, but not all got it correct. So what was the weakness? Weakness was failure to interpret the ratios that were necessary to obtain the probabilities of a head and a tail. Then another one was failure to generate the relevant combination. Remember, it should be n combination r times p to power r times q to power n minus r. And that formula is available in the logbook. So I encourage you not to make the mistake when the formula is there in the logbook. Then I advise that teachers should get students to determine ratios in binomial it should it should have binomial expansion here they use the expansion but it should have been binomial distribution then encourage students to deduce the necessary ratios in discrete distribution then emphasize the proper use of statistical tables because these formulas are there in the logbook question two says two bodies a and b of masses six and two move along a straight line with velocities 4 meters per second and 2 meters per second respectively collide head on mm -hmm. after collision a moves with a velocity of this in the same direction calculate the velocity of b after collision so let's begin with that one there is momentum now there is momentum. Now, because they have told us, because there is a change in velocity, you see this, they give us the velocity of B, and they give us the one that rest of, sorry, they, give, they have given us the velocity of A, and they want the velocity of B. Because there is, the two bodies have different velocities, it means that the collision was inelastic. The collision was inelastic. Now, this one moved in the same direction after collision, meaning we shall it will have the same sign as the one of U1. Change in sign is denoted by a change. Sorry, yeah, change in sign denotes a change in direction. Denotes a change in direction. So there's a formula for conservation of linear momentum. Initial is equal to final. Then I think you realize this direction to the left is negative. Directions to the right are positives. Like that. Then you can simplify and get the value of V, which is what, and that's what they wanted in part A. The impact be the one the loss in kinetic energy. Loss means the final was smaller than the initial. Therefore, it will be good by saying initial Ke -E minus final Ke. -E. Good enough, we have the masses and the velocities. So kinetic energy before, which is the initial, is that. Then kinetic energy after, which is the final, is that. Then next we subtract initial minus final to give you the loss in kinetic energy and that's what they wanted question analysis part a required kindness to calculate the velocity of one body after head-on collision part b required kindness to calculate the loss in kinetic energy it was not popular question meaning the few students attempted it Weakness was failure to deduce the direction, this one, because some students are used to the all-level questions of momentum where most of them are in one direction. But now it is okay to change direction. So when they change direction, you shouldn't get stuck. You should remember that changing direction is denoted by a change of sign. If one is positive, the other should be negative. So advice is that Chia should illustrate the concepts of momentum when bodies are moving in either same or opposite directions. So head-on is what meant means opposite because head-on means they should move and knock each other.
Then question three, the values of the of a function fx are given in the table below. So question two was from mechanics. Now question three is from numerical methods and specifically trapezium rule. So use trapezium rule to estimate the value of this correct to three decimal places. So they have helped us by giving us the values of fx. Our work is to add So you come and split the two values of fx because there are two values. We need extreme values and intermediate values. So those are the extreme values. So we shall get the total. Then also the intermediate values. They're already given, so we need to get the total, which is that. After that, we need to get the h. h is the interval from one from one ordinate to the other. So here, from here, tier the width. What is the width? Width will be got by this minus that, which is 0 0.5. Meaning they will keep on adding 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Code the formula, substitute, and then get the answer. So you first get the value without rounding off, then the actual value which they want. And that's what they wanted. So the question required candidates to apply trapezium rule while estimating the value of a, of a definite integral, correct to three decimal places. Weakness was failure to obtain the relevant interval necessary for computation. The value of h was a challenge. 2 was failure to substitute correctly in the appropriate, appropriate formula. So we need to code the formula correctly, then we can substitute. Advice was that teachers should guide students to obtain relevant interval and proper substitution. So most of the students are used to being given number of sub-intervals or number of ordinates. But this one you're supposed to find it out by yourself from the given table. I think that's what the, that was the challenge. So illustrate to students the use of appropriate number of decimal places during calculation. So appropriate number, you must boost accuracy. You must boost accuracy. Then question four, a ball of mass this rolls from rest down a rough plane inclined at this to the horizontal, okay? The ball rolls for five meter, for four meters before it reaches the ground. The coefficient of friction between the ball and the plane is a quarter. Find the velocity with which the ball rolls, the ball reaches the ground. So this is under Newton's laws of motion and it's under dynamics. So we shall need to make a sketch of an inclined plane. It rolls, that's why it will made it circular. So we shall need the weight of the ball Resolve the components horizontal and vertical. Then from there we shall need the normal reaction. And from normal reaction, they say it just rose, but there is friction here. So we need to get the direction of motion, which is downward. Then you can put friction to oppose motion. So that's the first diagram. Now we can resolve. Resolving power to the plane. We are interested in these forces, those ones. So this minus this is equal to ma. Then you substitute for g, for mu, and for r. r is this. Then get the value of a. 
From there, you can use the third equation of motion to substitute for initial because it was risked. Acceleration, which you have got, and the displacement, which it has moved. And that can give us the velocity. So basically, that's what they wanted. So question analysis, the question required candidates to determine deceleration should be acceleration, acceleration of the ball down an incline. So this should be acceleration. Then find the final find the final velocity of the ball, and it was a popular question. Weakness was failure to draw a correct first diagram. First diagrams are drawn with a ruler. So you should remember that. And the resolved components must be dotted. Then another weakness was interchange of forces while determining the resultant force. That is why it you must put the direction of motion, which is the acceleration. Because if you don't put, you will not know which is bigger than the other. Then advice to teachers to demonstrate to students the correct drawing of force diagrams and emphasize use of straight edges. These straight edges, use of a straight edge. Now a straight edge is what we call a ruler. For them they call it a straight edge. So use a ruler. Some students are funny, they use a second pen as a ruler. It is okay because it gives a straight edge, but it's advisable to use a ruler. Then encourage students to accurately use a proper use the proper directions of forces while finding the resultant force and hence deceleration acceleration down the plane it should be acceleration. Then question five question five is under statistics and that is group data it says. The table below shows the age distribution of a population of a certain town in a census. Part A, draw a histogram for the data. And part B, use the histogram to estimate the model age of the population. So if you see the word under and under and under, it means what the class is the same as class boundary. So the population is in thousands. Some of you are funny, you also keep on adding thousands. It is okay. But we put this to reduce on how big the numbers are. Now for you again, add them there to make them more big. It is not okay. So I encourage you to maintain the values which are given. So here, and that means that you just remove the inequalities to get the class and also the class boundary then for f it was given then now we are going to get the class width got by subtraction so this minus this this minus this subtract 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 so i think you realize that there's a change in class width meaning this is an equal class width Therefore, we, we plot frequency density against class boundaries, implying that we need a column of frequency density. Why we divide? This divided by this, this divided by this, this divided by this, this divided by this, divided by this, divided by this, divided by this. Okay, so we are going to plot frequency density against class boundary. So I need a graph paper. Draw the axis, horizontal and vertical. Then we get the scale for the horizontal axis. Use intervals of 2 to 2 centimeters and then get an appropriate scale. For me, I use 2 centimeters represents 10 units. Remember to label the axis. Do the same for the vertical. Intervals of 2 to 2 centimeters and then get an appropriate scale.
we might label the axis. Then next is to plot. So from 0 to 10, it, the bar stops at 1.5, which is this. From 10 to 20, it is 1.9. which is this. Then from 20 to 30, it stops at 1.6. From 30 to 40, it stops at 1.8. Then from 40 to 60, it stops at 1.5. From 60 to 80, it is 0 0.3. And lastly, 80 to 90, it is 0 0.1. So that's what they wanted. But they also told us to estimate the mode. Estimate means this is the highest. So we shall use that to draw the diagonal from there to there. And also from here to here. Then the intersection would drop a vertical line to read the horizontal axis. Then we read of that point. And that would be the mod, and that's what they wanted. So question analysis, the question required candidates to test the intervals to establish whether they are equal or unequal. Then calculate the frequency densities for the unequal intervals and draw a histogram to estimate the model H. The question was a popular question. However, some candidates had challenges because of failure to test for the correct interval, then failure to calculate the frequency densities for the unequal intervals, and also failure to draw a histogram with uniform scale. That is where problems are. When it comes to histogram, most candidates find challenges with drawing uniform scale. You find a student from 30, you go to 40, from 40, you go to 60. That is not uniform. That is a big challenge, and I don't know. I hope you won't do the same mistake in case it comes. So failure to locate the mode on the histogram. Most of you have a final formula for locating mode. Do you know what you do? If these are the highest and these are the next, for you what you do, you join this line to this line and this to this. That is already problems. That is already problems. Then advice emphasize the class width. So histogram, when class widths are equal, it is a frequency against frequency boundary against class boundary. But when they are unequal, it is frequency density against class boundary. So add guide students to distinguish between the method for equal and unequal. That's what I've just said. Then draw histograms with uniform scales. So now shall go to question six. Question six came from numerical methods under the topic of errors. So the question says the numbers x, which is 6.45, y, which is 0 0.00215, and z, which is 2.7, are rounded off to the given number of decimal places. Determine the interval, the keyword is here is interval, in which w which is equal to this given by that lies so interval means we get the maximum and minimum and we put them in a box bracket the first thing is to get the error in each and the error in each depends on the number of decimal places so here there are two decimal places meaning you need two zeros before a five here there are five decimal places, meaning you need five zeros before a five. Here one decimal place, meaning you need one zero before a five. Okay. After that, you remember that to minimize, this is now a quotient. To minimize a quotient, the numerator sh should be minimum and denominator should be maximum. Just as you see here, minimum numerator, maximum denominator. Then to minimize addition, it means both should be minimum. So that's why you see minimum x, minimum z. Here maximum y to give you this. 
So here, they did not specify the number of decimal places or the address, meaning 6 and above. So we apply to maximum, now the numerator will be maximum, denominator will be minimum. And for maximum numerator, you'll need maximum addition where both are maximum. And down to be minimum to give you this. After getting the maximum and minimum, you'll need to use a box bracket. After getting the maximum and minimum, you need to use a box bracket. Reason, because they specified interval. That's what they wanted. So question analysis, the question required candidates to determine errors of numbers and maximum and minimum values, hence stating the interval within which the given expression lies. So the popular question meaning it was attempted by a number of students. However, there are some who misfired, and that will, the reasons were failure to state the errors of the individual values. So like I told you, the number of decimal places are the number of zeros you put before you put a 5. The number of decimal places are the number of decimal zeros you put before a 5. Then, failure to maximize and minimize. You need to know maximizing a quotient and also minimizing a quotient. Then you also need to, needed to know maximizing a, a, dish, a, a sum, which is addition, and also minimizing a sum, which is also addition. Then also deduce the correct interval within which the expression lies. So deduction of an interval. It has to, at the end of everything, we have to see a box bracket. They are, they are actually three ways of writing an interval, though this is the one which is more common. Others can choose to use inequalities, but the inequalities should be O equal to. Should have the O equal to sign. So this is the simplest. This is the simplest. Then also advise that teacher should get students to find errors of numbers in relation to their number of decimal places. Then also illustrate maximization, minimization, and proper setting of interval. So question seven came from probability under the topic of probability theory. So it says two events, R and S, are such that probability of R is three quarters and probability of S is equal to probability of neither S nor R occurring. Find part A probability of S and part B probability of S complement intersection R, that is the same as probability of R only. So for part A, we shall come and see that first of all, we are given probability of R is that. Okay. And probability of S is equal to probability of S complement intersection R complement. Now, if events are independent, also their E complements must be independent. If you know that, you can still use it. These are independent meaning their complements should be also independent. Then remember that this complement is the same as 1 minus probability of S, 1 minus probability of R. But I know the probability of R here, so come and substitute there. Now I have only one unknown, which is probability of S. So this one gives you a quarter. So a quarter times one is this. A quarter times PS is this. Okay. My aim is to make PS the subject. I can collect like terms, take this side to give you 5 over 4 times PS. Then next is to divide. To come up with, or oh, you can say this comes with this. Then this 5 goes aside to come up with 1 over 5. So that is one way of getting probability of S. But we can also, also use Venn diagram or contiguous table to also get the probability of S, as we shall see. So let's first get the probability of R only. Okay. 
probability of R only comes from this, which is X y and does this because these are also independent. Because of the word independent, I want you to note that we are using this because they told us that R and S are independent. If they had not, then we couldn't do it. There is one. What if? Mm -hmm. What if you use Venn diagram or contiguous table? How would your solution be? Would you come and say that from contiguous table, this first of all is the same as this because this means neither A nor B. Okay, neither S nor R. So if you are drawing a Venn diagram, this probability will be here outside here. So the same as 1 minus the union, because union has this, R has S and has the intersection. So 1 minus the union gives us what is here. Neither S nor R. But I know the expansion of R from the logbook. It is that. And I know that the intersection is this. Because of the word independent. So I come and substitute. And when I substitute, I realize that I have only one unknown, which is S. So my work is to simply make it the subject. My work is to simply make it the subject and to come up with the value of S, like that. Then I can now get this, still by contagious table, to get the, the same value as before. So whatever you choose to use is okay. Even using the tree diagram, even using the Venn diagram is okay. So question analysis, the question required candidates to determine the probabilities for independent events. It was a popular question, however, some misfired due to failure to define independent events. So like I told you, if two events are independent, then their complements must also be independent. Then two Failure to deduce that if two events are independent, then their complements are also independent. Some students didn't know that. So I advise that teachers should get students to apply all the concepts of independent events and also demonstrate the generation of entries in the intersections of the contiguous table. So this is because the could, equation could be used, could be answered using this or this. Whatever I choose. Then question eight came from mechanics under the topic of center of gravity and in particular a uniform lamina. So it says that an uniform lamina in form of a square with side 60 centimeters has a circular hole of radius 20 centimeters made in it as shown in the diagram below. The position of the center of gravity of the lamina from side AD, eh, sorry, find the position of the center of gravity of the lamina from side AD. The keyword is position. Keyword is position. So questions in this form are easily done by tabulating. But before you tabulate, you must make this unknown. You must define your an unknown. The let rho denote weight per unit area. We're using the word area because of the word lamina. If it was a solid, we would have said weight per unit volume. We use area because it's a lamina. Then you can tabulate. So I'll need column for the figure, column for the weight, and column for the x-coordinate. We are saying x-coordinate because it asks for distance from side AD. Only that distance from side AD. And those distances are horizontal meaning there are x values. Okay, so let's begin with figure of a square for the whole lamina. For a square, 
area is length times width, which is this. But because they want weight, we add on row to give you 3600 row. Then the center of gravity for the square alone is halfway the length AB. So half of 60 to give you 30. So next is a circle. For the circle, the area is pi r squared. Then you add on the row to get the weight, to, which gives you this. So you first leave this as an unknown. The good thing our calculator has that symbol for pi. Okay. Then the center of gravity from here t r. First of all, I know that from here t r is 60, and this one is 20. So the balance is 60 minus 20 to give you 40. Then also for the remaining lamina. For the remainder. Remainder means area will be, okay, the weight. The remaining weight will be rate of the whole square minus weight of the area. When you do that, you come up with the remaining weight, which is this minus this to give this. So rho is common, that's why it has been put outside. Then the remain, then the center of gravity of the remainder is what we want. So you can show given unknown as x bar. Okay. After that, next is to take moments. Remember, moment is weight times distance. Force times distance. Weight times this. Weight times this. Weight times this. But you need to remember that these two make up the whole. These two make up the whole. So when you take moments, you will take moments for these two on one side and moment for this on the other side. Okay, so let's do that. So now we are going to take moments about a D. So you see, whole equal to the individual ones. This for the circle and this for the remainder. Then you realize that we have only one un unknown. Do you know why? Because here, I can choose to remove this. I can choose to remove the row. And there I will have only one unknown. Using a calculator, I'll come up with this as the answer. And that will be now the position you conclude. Position from AD is that. So the key word was position. Sometimes they give you the word, they use the word coordinates. So it should be written in coordinate form. But here they wanted only position so question analysis the question required candidates to determine the center of gravity of the remainder of the uniform lamina from one of the sides and the question was not popular meaning it disturbed many students and many students didn't even tamper to attempt it but those who attempted it, the weakness was failure to derive the weight of the circular and square lamina. Driving means you need to let. You need to let. Rho be equal to weight per unit area. So that was a challenge to many. Letting was a challenge. But remember to let always. Then failure to locate the centers of gravity of the different parts of the lamina. So we need to know how to get the center of gravity of a uniform square, center of gravity of a uniform circle, like that. Then failure to apply the principle of moments, where moments, where moment of the remainder is that difference between the moments of the whole and moment of the part removed. So this was a challenge. Some of the students, let me show you what they could do. They could say this plus this equal to this, which is not okay. It should be whole on one side, then the individual components on the other side. Advise that teachers should expose students to the procedure of determining weights and distances from the specified location. Then illustrate the application of the principle of moments in obtaining the center of gravity of a lamina. So moments usually disturb students, but the best way to do them easily is to tabulate. 
the best way to do them easily is to tabulate. There was section A which contained eight questions um, and of which two were from numerical methods, three were from mechanics, and three were from probability and statistics. Now we are going to section B which also has eight questions of which two are from numerical methods, two, three are from probability and statistics, and three are from mechanics. But remember, a student is supposed to attempt only five. Attempt only five. And all questions carry equal marks. So question nine is from probability and statistics under the topic of scatter graphs and correlation. So it says, the table below shows the scores of 10 candidates in biology and economics. Part A, Roman 1, plot a scatter diagram for the data. Okay. Draw a line of best fit on the scatter diagram. Okay. Use your line of best fit to estimate the biology mark for a candidate who scored 57 in economics. Part B, Calculate the rank correlation coefficient between the candidate's performance in the two subjects. Comment on your result. So here, when they want you, to, when the question requires scatter diagram and rank correlation coefficient, it is better you first tabulate before you go to graph work for only one reason, which you are going to see. So I shall come and we tabulate. So this column for students is optional, but you can put it there to complete the sentence which was given. So we have students, then we have the values of x, which we are given. Now, why did I tell you to first to first draw the table. It's because we, by all means we need the sum of these ones. Which is which will, which will help us to get the mean point. Now if you don't tabulate it means we must say a sentence whereby you are adding all these values which will be now double work because even if you show that you will still draw the table under the part B which requires rank correlation coefficient. So the base is to do everything at once. So do the same for y. But if you prefer separating them, it is also okay. Then we shall also get the sum. Now next is to rank. Rank is done in descending order. So highest is rank 1. Then go to the second, which is to rank 2 now. Go to the third, which is 3. Go to the fourth, which is 4. Go to the fifth, which is five. Go to sixth, which is that. Then rank seven. Then rank eight. Then rank nine. And lastly, rank ten. Okay. Then we shall go to rank for y still in descending order this rank one this is rank two this is rank three this is rank four rank five rank six now this one there are two so you need to get the average of position six and position seven to give you 6.5 which you put on both 6.5 6.5 the next is now position eight because six and seven have been taken so this is eight then nine so you need to get an also average which is 9.5 so you put 9.5 here and 9.5 there so next is to get the difference so this minus this this minus this this minus this, this minus this, 
this minus this, this minus this, this minus this, this minus this, this minus this, and this minus that. Okay, the next is to square the difference. This squared, 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 and that squared. Then you need to get the sum of all these ones, which gives you that. So that's the table you need to draw before even starting the scalar diagram. The reason is for you to get these values because they are going to use them to get the main point. Now we can go to the scalar graph. Scatter graph, you'll need a graph paper. Then you draw the axes, both vertical and horizontal. Down here, you only leave what you are going, the space you're going to use to write. Even here, you leave the space you're going to use to write only. Then use intervals of two to ten meters and get a good scale so that all values can fit. Label the axes. It is mandatory. It tells us what the graph is about. Do the same for the vertical intervals of 2 to 10 meters. And after you get a good scale so that all values can fit, then you also label. After that, next is to plot. So your plot 45 goes with 90, which is this. 60 goes with 64, which is this. Sorry, 63 goes with 64. Then 56 with 76. 61 with 70. 75 with 55. 83 with 53 with 62, 50 with 85, 77 with 53, and 70 with 62. Okay, so that is called scatter diagram. But we also, part B was about, okay, Roman 2 was about line of base fit. So line of base fit, that is why I need to first get the mean point. So you already know the X bar, sorry, oh, this is not X bar. This is called summation X, summation X, let me first see here what I wrote. Yeah, this is okay, summation X. So then here should be summation X here. Those are the summations which we use to get the mean. So you come and say that x bar is now that and y bar is now that. Therefore, the main point is that. So we need to add this extra point on our, on our graph. So let's add it there. We circle it. Okay, look, do something to make it different. If you have been circling this here, you can put maybe capital M to mean mean point. Now, we line of best fit fulfills three conditions. One, it must go through this. That is one. Two, it must go through any other one or more points. And three, it must leave equal or almost equal points on either side. Equal means if it leaves four here, even not four here. Almost equal means the difference of one. So when we look through that line, which that would be our line of best fit. Let's see if it fulfills the conditions. One, it has gone through this. That's condition one fulfilled. Two, it has gone through another point. That's condition two fulfilled. Then three, we, should, we need to count the points on the other side. Here there is one, two, three, four. Those are four here. Then here there is one, two, three, four, five. Those are five here. So it is a good line of best fit. Mm -hmm. Now, here, some students get disturbed with whether to draw a line with a positive gradient or negative gradient. So here, if you draw a line with a positive gradient, it is not okay. But how do you know? 
If you want to know, then before you draw the line of base feet, first answer part B. First answer part B. So we shall see part B. But now let's first go in order and we answer these parts. But when we answer part B, I'll tell you what, how you know that we have a negative gradient, opposite gradient. So Roman 3, they asked for an estimation. Use your line of best fit to estimate the mark, the biology mark for a candidate who scored 57 in economics. So when economics is 57, what is biology mark? So we shall look for 57, take a horizontal line to meet the line of best fit, then drop a vertical line to meet the horizontal axis and read off that value. And that will be the answer they wanted. So I'll come and say, let me first give a mark for this. So I'll come and say that the biology mark for Kanye Juice Squad 57 in economics is 78. So part B, they wanted you to calculate the rank correction coefficient. So you shall code the formula, substitute, and get the output. Now it is at this point that I want to tell you to reduce this calculation, it has a negative value. When it has a negative value, it means that even the line of best fit must have a negative gradient. Okay, then commenting. Commenting is done using the tab mathematical tables. We shall come here and look for a pair of 10. These are the values. Then you see this comment, it says, significant if the magnitude of what you have calculated exceeds this value at this percentage. So what you have calculated is 0 0.9818, I think. And this value is 0 0.65. So it, the, the calculated value is bigger. So use the word significant. If I'm to use 1% also, the calculated value is bigger than this. So we shall use significant. That is why you are saying here, Significant, significant. Now they said comment, meaning you choose only one. Choose only one. Okay, so question analysis. Part A required candidates to plot a scalar diagram, draw line of best fit, and determine the value of a test given the other value. Okay. Part B required candidates to determine rank correction coefficient and comment on the result. It was a popular question, meaning it was attempted by many. However, some had challenges and one of them was failure to use a uniform scale. So you need to get the scale for your graph. You don't just scatter points anyhow. Then failure to label axes and to plot adequate number of points. Some plotted and, and left other points unplotted. Failure to draw the line of best fit following the three conditions and failure to accurately compute the ranks. Ranking is done in ascending order. So failure to rank means the correction coefficient is not okay. And also suitable comment will not be okay. Advise that you should expose students to proper ranking processes and to illustrate to students how to label axes, use uniform scales, and draw the accurate diagrams. I think I've done that. Teachers should guide students on how to give comments with reference to mathematical tables. I want you to note that. Mathematical tables. Some students are funny. They still want to use these things like there is a positive correlation, low positive correlation, high positive correlation. Those will be crossed. Those comments, I repeat, the comments that have very high correlation coefficient, very high positive correlation, very low co positive correlation, or negative what, those comments are no longer for principal math. They are for subsidiary math. Yours, it must be mathematical tables. Comments for principal mathematics must be from mathematical tables okay hope that is done 
Now question 10. Question 10 came from came from mechanics under the topic of mo linear motion or motion in a straight line. It says two points A and B are five to six meters apart along a switch road. A car moving along the road passes point A with a constant speed of this. Okay. The car maintains this speed for 10 seconds and then decelerates for 8 seconds until it attains a speed V. The car maintains this speed until until it passes point B. The total time taken by the car to move from A to B is 30 seconds. Part A, sketch a velocity time graph for the motion of the car. Part B, determine Roman 1 the value of V and Roman 2 the deceleration of the car. So we need a velocity time graph. So the first motion was about, let me see. Okay, there were two cars. Car A, sorry, the, it is just one car. And it first maintains a speed that is now constant velocity. Uh -huh. Then it decelerates. Okay. Then it again maintains until it reaches point B. So that's the shape of the graph. Okay, now let's draw it. So drawing, we need to draw the axes and label them. Axes and label them. Then we can start for the first 10 seconds, the velocity is 25, so you can locate that and it is whole. constant velocity. Okay, for the next 8 seconds, the velocity is now V, there is some deceleration. Then for the uh, remaining part, remember the total time was 30, so remaining time will be 12 minutes, 12, 12, sorry, 12 seconds. And it is also still constant velocity, and that's what they wanted. Then part B, let me see what they wanted in part B. Determine the value of V and the deceleration of the car. So they want the value of V. One should know that total distance is the area under the graph. Area under the graph. So here... I used this, but another one can also choose to do this. I can another one can choose to use this trapezium and this rectangle. It is still okay. It's still okay. So for me, what I did, I divided into three. There is this rectangle. Area is this. There's this trapezium. Area is this. And there's also this rectangle. Area is that. Whatever you do is okay. Equate the total distance, then simplify. There's only one unknown, which is V. So I can make it the subject. And that's what they wanted. Mm, now, there's something I want you to see. Yeah, do you see here? The V already has a unit. The V already has a unit. Therefore, here, when you're giving the final answer, you don't put a unit. You just leave it as V because it means that your work is to carry that value and put it back here to get 11 meters per second. But if I put a unit, it means that I, I'm going to put 11 meters per second, meters per second, which is not okay. Which is not okay. Then they also wanted deceleration by less for CMAX for this slide. Okay. Then deceleration, we know final, we know initial velocity. We know final velocity and we know the time. So we can get the value of A. That A is acceleration. That's why you say negative. So you have to conclude that deceleration is that. And that's what they wanted. So question analysis. The question part A required candidates to draw a velocity time graph for the motion. And part B required candidates to determine the Velocity and deceleration of the car. It was not a popular question, meaning few students attempted it. 
but some who attempted it misfired somewhere. One was failure to sketch the velocity time graph. Now this one should be done with a ruler. Velocity time graph should be done with a ruler. Then failure to obtain the area under the curve. So area should be calculated well. Then failure to find the velocity and deceleration of the car. Of course, when the, this is not okay, then the rest of your also cannot be okay. Advice to teachers that illustrate the sketching of motion graphs. Then guide students to determine the area of different shapes, specifically trapezium, because that is what disturbed many. That was question 10. Now question 11. Question 11 came from numerical methods under the topic of, okay, okay, this one is called root location, and this one is now a better approximation of the root using linear interpolation. Okay, so part A says, okay, given that fx is that, part A, Roman 1, Evaluate F1 and F2 correct to four decimal places. You see that? Accuracy is given. Then deduce that the equation of Fx equal to 0 has a root between x equal to 1 and x equal to 2. Okay, let's begin with part A. 1, we shall need physical substitution. Physical substitution is needed. Some of you are funny because calculators nowadays can do this at once and get this final answer. But in this question, we need physical substitution and we need strictly for decimal places. So basically, that was a Roman one. Then Roman two, they wanted you to reduce. Reducing means change of sign change of sign so i'll come and say that since the product is less than zero then there's a root and that's what they wanted okay then part b part b said use linear interpolation twice to obtain the root of the equation this Correct to three decimal places. Correct to three decimal places. Okay. So shall I begin with what we know? We know F1 and we know F2. So that's what we shall begin with. So F1, the value is that. The root is zero and F2 is that. Then use interpolation. Correct quotient. This minus this over this minus this is equal to this minus this over this minus that, which is that. Simplify to get the value of x naught. So when you make x is not the subject, you come up with this. Now this is something I've used five decimal places. Why? It is because of the question. The question said they want the final answer to three decimal places. Now for us, we have to boost accuracy by adding on two more decimal places. Then from there, you get the corresponding value of fx, which is that. So do you see second interpolation now? Do you see this is a negative, meaning it will replace this. We shall remove this and put there this. Remove this one and put there this. So let's first see the maths of this slide. Okay. So let's come and draw another table. We have now that. We have now x1 and we have 2. Then we shall still use interpolation, equate quotients, simplify, make x1 the subject. So still five decimal places. So here they told us that we use it twice. So we stop there and round off this value to 
three decimal places and that is all. So question analysis, part A required kindness to evaluate the given function of fx and two different values of x and deduce that the root of the function lies between the values of x, the given values of x. Then part B required kindness to use linear interpolation twice and obtain the root of the equation correct to three decimal places. Popular question, however, some misfired because of failure to correct the obtained values to the required number of decimal places. So you need to boost accuracy and at the very end you need to round off the required accuracy. Then failure to make a proper deduction related to position of the root, that is root location. And failure to apply linear interpolation for the second time. Most of the students are used to using linear interpolation to get the initial approximation but this time it was being used to get a better approximation then advice to teachers to emphasize the deduction in existence of a root how do you deduce there should be a change of sign then guide students to accurately eliminate errors with higher powers in approximating to zero then up then teachers should demonstrate the application of linear interpolation more than once okay there was question 11 now question 12. Okay, question 12 came from probit and statistics under the topic of continuous under the topic of random variables in particular continuous random variables so it says a continuous random variable x capital x has a cumulative distribution function given by this okay find part a the median part b probability density function part c probability of x greater than or equal to 1 but less or equal to 2.5 and part d the mean of x okay so the first they wanted median median you need to first test so when i test do you see this zero when I put 0 here, it is 1 over 6. Mm -hmm. When I push 2 here, it will be 5 over 6. Meaning median is within this because 1 over 6 is 0. Point, is it 0. Point, no, let me see 1 divided by 6 is 0. 0.1666 like that. So it is smaller than 0. 0.5. But this one is 5.6 and 5.6 is bigger than 0. 0.5. 5.6 let me see here it is 0 0.83333 so meaning that median is in this interval here after knowing that you'll come and say that let m be the median when it is the median it means fm is equal to 0 0.5 where there is x we put there m then you get the value of m as 1 so that is the median then part b they said Find the probability density function of fx, the probability density function, small fx. That is good by differentiating. So shall come and differentiate. So that interval will differentiate this to get that. For this interval, we differentiate this to get this. For this, we differentiate this to get that. And for this, we differentiate this to get that. Then you can write, combine everything, which is that, and that's what they wanted. So that was part B. What about part C? 
part C, they want the probability from 1 to 2.5. So 1, let me show you here. So 1 is in this range. So use this formula. 2.5 is in this range, so we use this formula like that. Then we subtract the 2. So I'll come here. And so the required probability is equal to this subtraction, substitute, get the answer. And there is it. Then part D, they wanted mean of x. Mean is got by integrating small fx. So integrate. Remember it is x, p, x, fx. So this times x gives you this. This times x gives this. This times x, you get that. So integrate all for this one, get this, for this one, integrate, for this one, integrate. Then substitute limits and get the required mean. And that's what they wanted. Okay. So the question required kindness to determine median, PDF, probability, and mean of x from accumulative distribution function it was popular but was but some kindness misfired due to failure to locate and find the value of the median so median you have to test failure to differentiate in order to obtain small fx failure to use cumulative distribution function while calculating the required probabilities so some struggled to integrate, which is also a problem. Then advice to teachers is to elaborate the use of cumulative distribution function in finding probabilities. So using cumulative distribution function involves substitutions and subtraction, simple as that. Then emphasize the use of PDF to find the mean. So mean you can't use cumulative. You have to go back to the PDF. So that was question 12. Now we shall go to question 13. Question 13 is under mechanics and the part of statics, particular moments and couples. So it says three forces, this, this, and that, act at points, these ones, respectively. Determine the magnitude of their resultant. So magnitude of resultant in vector form is simply you first add to get the vector resultant. Resultant in vector form. Then from there you can use Pythagoras theory to get the magnitude. They only wanted magnitude, so it's up there. Then you go to part B. Part B, they said the equation of the line of action of the resultant. So we take moments of individual forces and we equate it to moments of the resultant we at a point x y so moment of individual sum of moments is equal to moment of resultant which is that these are the individual force, forces and this is the moment of the resultant so this one is the coordinate of the force and this is the force so we do coordinate force coordinate force coordinate force like that Magnitude of that is the same as getting the determinant, major minus minor, major minus minor, major minus minor, major minus minor. Then simplify to get an equation, a Cartesian equation, and that's what I want. That was part B, then part C. Pass the one the distance from the origin at which the resultant cuts the x axis. It cuts when it cuts the x axis that is now the x intercept. And x intercept means y is zero. So come and substitute y equal to zero to get the value of x, and that's what they wanted. Okay, then part D. Part D says, 
determine the force that should be added to form a couple. Force that should be added to form a couple opposite should be opposite to the resultant. So your work is to get the opposite force, which is negative of that, to give you that. So that's what should be added to form a couple. Okay, then question analysis. The question required candidates to determine part A, magnitude of the resultant force, two, equation of line of action, three, distance from the origin of the result where the resultant cuts the x-axis, and four, force that should be added for to form a couple. Question was popular, but some students mystified due to failure to obtain the magnitude of the resultant. So you have to add well. Failure to equate equal mom to equate equal moments in order to determine the line of action, and also failure to state the conditions of cutting the x-axis, and also failure to deduce the force that would be added to cause equilibrium forces. So advice is that teachers should get students to resolve horizontally, vertically take moments and use a suitable point in order to obtain the line of best fit. So there are two options. I only gave you one approach. But there's another approach where you have to first resolve horizontally, vertically, then you take moments and then substitute the equation for the line of action. It is also okay. Then emphasize the condition for crossing x-axis. X-axis means it is an x-intercept. Therefore, y should be zero. So that was question 13, now I shall go to question 14. Question 14 came from numerical methods and the NRM and analytical Raphson method and flow charts. So part A says, show that the formula based on newton Raphson method for approximating the kth root of a number capital N is given by this. So let's begin with that. So let x the root be let this root be x. Okay. Then you're going to power both sides with k so that this goes away. Because this times k gives power 1 and yet becomes k to give you this. Put everything on one side, that becomes your fx, and then you can differentiate it. Then substitute in Newton Robson formula. So substitute for fx and f prime x, but this time it is xn. Put everything under one LCM, open brackets and simplify to get the required expression. Okay, so that was part A, then let's go to part B. Part B Construct a flowchart that reads the initial approximation, these ones, mm -hmm. then computes and prints n and its kth root. Do you see that? n and its kth root. Correct to three decimal places. Let's just deal with that. So there's only one condition. The condition is on the number of decimal places, which is now the tolerance. So I'll come. So in flow chart, everything begins with a start statement. Then you go to your initialize. After that, you can now put the read statement. They want you to read this. This so what you put here is what is doing the question. Then from there they wanted you to compute, so you have to put the formula you derived. Then from there you have to go to the decision on the number of decimal places you want this expression to give you. That is called tolerance. It was three decimal places, that's why you see three zeros followed by five. Then from there you can print. They told you to print the root, the n and its root. Okay, 
So that is pr the print is after it has fulfilled this condition. If it has not, we need a loop which I shall put. So we shall come and put a loop where the loop will increase the iteration and the root like that. So basically, that's what they wanted. Then part C, part C they wanted to perform a dry run, mainly perform a dry run. But given some initial values, let's first see those values. So perform a dry run for your flowchart when n is 13, x0 is 1.6, and k is 14. So a dry run is tabulated. But we begin by putting there the values in the read statement because the question, the flowchart tells you to read. When you put those values, you are going to come up with this formula and that's what you'll use in your dry run. So need those columns, the iteration, the root, and also the difference, which is the tolerance. So n not means there's no iteration yet. You have that root. Then the first iteration gives you that to get that difference. You write this iteration here to get the second iteration, which gives you that. You write this here to get the third one, which gives this difference. Write it here to get the fourth one, which gives the difference. So we have got a value which is smaller than tolerance, meaning we can conclude. And that's what they wanted. So question analysis, question required kindness to derive the form, iterative formula, construct a flowchart that reads the initial value of the initial value k and n, and then compute the values. Then also perform a dry run of for the flowchart. The question was popular though some kind of misfire due to failure to express x as the kth root of n. And two, failure to arrange the flowcharts chat boxes and arrows appropriately. So each box, each statement has its own shape of box. Then failure to include the correct information in the flowchart. Then failure to perform a dry run for the flowchart with all the columns eg n. So n was me being left out, which is needed. Then advice to teachers expose students to different types of flowcharts and arranging an arrangement of boxes. Then demonstrate to students the logical flow of information in the charts. Then emphasize performing a dry run and include all the necessary columns. So now shall go to question 15. Question 15 comes from probability still. Probability and under the topic of probability theory. So it says, a woman traveling to work by car goes through three police checkpoints, A, B, and C. The probability is that she is delayed at A, at B, and at C are these ones, respectively. Determine the probability that she is delayed at only one checkpoint and or and two or more checkpoints. So let's begin with only one checkpoint. So P only want means delayed at A alone, or delayed at B alone, or delayed at C alone. Then you can substitute. So let's see how they come about. So the probit of A, probit of B, probit of C, meaning the complements will be 1 minus that. So 1 minus this gives you 0 0.7, which is A complement. 
1 minus this gives you 0 0.5, which is B complement, and 1 minus this gives you 0 0.3, which is C complement. So that's how they come about. We are multiplying because they are independent. These three are independent. So we come up with that as the answer. Then part B, they say two or more. Two or more means two or three. So this is two, this is two, this is two, and this is three. Like that. So you substitute independence, so that's why you multiply, then we get the answer. That is one way. Another one could say two or more means is a complement of one or none. So it also gives, gives the same answer. So alternatively, one can say two or more is the same as one minus square root of nine or one. So you still get the same answer of that. Then part B says a woman goes to work by root P or Q. Okay. The probability that she takes the probability that she takes root P is 0 0.6. The probability that she is late given that he given that he goes through P is 2 over 3. And through Q is 1 over 3. Okay. Know that there is a condition. Find the probability that he is late for work on a certain day. Then Roman 2. Given that he is not late. Determine the probability that he went through P. So shall need a tree diagram. The two roots then let and let complement. Okay. So shall go back and say. See something? Mm -hmm. Probability of taking root P is 0 0.6. Okay. Probability of taking root P. Probably that his late given it is he took P is that. Then late given he took Q is this. So it shall come. Begin with the probability of P, which is 0 0.6. And the other one should be 0 0.4 to make a 1. Then late given P is 2 over 3, meaning this should be 1 over 3. Late given Q is 1 over 3, meaning this should be 2 over 3. Then the probability was... Find the probability that he is late for work on a certain day. Late for work. So late there is this and this. So we shall add both of them. Okay. Then Roman 2. Roman 2 they said... Given that he is not late, okay, determine the probability that he went through P. Given is a condition. So P given not late is that substitute and give the answer. Okay, so that's what they wanted. Question analysis, part A required candidates to determine the probability of delay at only one checkpoint and at two or more checkpoints. Part B required candidates to determine the probability that a man is late for work and that the man went through a point given he was not late. Popular question, but some misfire due to failure to arrange probabilities at one checkpoint and at one at two or more checkpoints so getting all the possibilities was a challenge then failure to substitute correctly in the arrangement was also a challenge substituting the complements then failure to select the correct pairs of probabilities of man being late that means that they didn't draw three diagrams then failure to interpret conditional probability so the word given means a conditional probability 
advised that teachers should illustrate correct substitutions in probability arrangements. Then teachers should guide students to deduce the concept of conditional. So each time you see given, it is a conditional probability. So you need to go slow. Then question 16, it says the diagram below shows three masses, this, this, and that. So there's this, this, this. Connected by light inelastic strings, the string connecting the 12 and 9 kilogram masses passes over smooth fixed pulley. The other string connects 9 kilogram mass and 7 kilogram masses. The system is released from rest and the 12 kilogram mass accelerates upwards. Part A, calculate, Roman 1, the acceleration of the system. Roman 2, the tension in the strings. Part B, determine the velocity of the 12 kilogram mass after 1.5 seconds. So let's begin with part A. Now here, they helped you by drawing for you the diagram and also telling you the direction of movement. Otherwise, most cases it will be you to identify it. So I'm going to first redraw the given diagram and then put the forces. So you put five, begin with weight, there there is weight, even the 9 kilogram mass has weight, the 7 kilogram mass has weight. Then tension, there are two strings, so you shall put T1, arrows pointing towards each other, even there are T1, arrows pointing towards each other, and there are T2, arrows pointing towards each other. Then you shall put accelerations, 12 goes upwards, 9 will go downwards, same acceleration, 7 will also go downwards, same acceleration. Then you can use now F equal to MA. For the 12 kilogram mass, we are interested in these forces. Do you see this direction to show that this is bigger than this? So it will be T1 minus 12G equal to 12A. For the 9 kilogram mass, we are interested in this. So acceleration is this size, meaning that these two are bigger. That's why you see 9G plus T2 minus T1 equal to 9A. Then for the 7 kilogram mass, we're interested in these forces. So that direction means this is bigger than this. So it will be 7G minus T2 equal to 7A. Then we now begin to solve simultaneously. The first thing to do is to eliminate the tensions. So here, I've managed, these were two tensions, I removed one to get only T2 now. Now that means that I have, I can eliminate T2 using this by adding, of course, by adding, of course, let's see the max for this slide. Okay, so I'll come here and also add, in order to eliminate the T2, then I get the value of A. Then Roman 2, let me see, Roman 2, Roman 2, they wanted tension, so I'll come and say from equation 1, substitute for A, then get the value of T. What about from equation 3, substitute to get the value of T2. Then part B, they wanted velocity, let me first see. They wanted velocity of the 12 kilogram mass after... 1.5 seconds so the good thing we know acceleration we know initial velocity we know the time so we can use first equation of motion and substitute to get what they want okay so question analysis Part A required candence to calculate acceleration of connected particles. 
and the tension in the vertical strings. Vertical means they are tight. Part B required kindness to determine the final velocity of one of the particles after 1.5 seconds. Popular question but some misfire due to failure to apply the concept of resultant force while deriving the equation of motion of the particles. So F equal to MA. F means resultant force in the direction of motion. Failure to solve simultaneously for acceleration and tension in the equations formulated and failure to apply the condition of collision. Collision? No, 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 no. Was there any collision? No. So this wasn't there. Should be missing. Then advise demonstrate teachers should demonstrate how to formulate equations. Since I've done that. Then guide students to explore various methods of solving simultaneous equations. So here it is advisable to eliminate tension first. It is advisable to eliminate tension first. If you choose the first eliminate acceleration, then problems will come. Okay, so general remarks is that the paper were from questions were from topics of mechanics. Statistics, stroke probability, and numerical methods. I think I've had me say mechanics, statistics, numerical methods. And here, three come from mechanics in section A and also three in section B. Statistics and probability, three section A, three section B. Numerical, two section A, two section B. Then the performance of this, of the year 2023, was comparable to that of the year 2022. The quality of work presented by candidates was also comparable, so they were, meaning there was a slight change. Then the paper was more difficult than that of the previous year, so they admit it was a little more difficult. Then the time of three hours allocated was adequate, so you don't need to say the time is not enough. The time of three hours is already enough. So this is a summary of well done questions. Poorly done questions, most attempted, and least attempted. So I draw attention on some questions. Question these two, these ones. Do you see them? They are here, least attempted, but also they are among the well done. They are among the well done. Okay. So that brings us to the end.